Jim. So uh, many of you are familiar with how we use uh, the principles of momentum in our investment strategy. Uh, within our investment management strategies, we are purposefully over allocating to areas of strength in the market and purposely under allocating to areas of weakness. In essence, we're starting to use uh, certain funds at certain times and then quitting them at other times. Momentum exists in financial planning as well. It just looks a little bit different. Uh, what we can achieve uh, through financial planning by beginning certain practices and quitting others is getting clearer about goals and getting nearer to them. And that is the heart of momentum in financial planning. As you get clear about your goals and nearer to them, there is a, a focus and an organization and a very positive mood that comes with that uh, that uh, is very tangible. The practices I want to talk about today uh, that are worth uh, starting is uh, bringing awareness to spending. And a great way to do that is by creating a budget. The practice that I think is, is worth quitting because I think it, it gets in the way of building momentum is taking a singular view of the market. Uh, much better to incorporate multiple views of the market when you are going to make uh, major life decisions that, that have impact, that impact your financial circumstances. What we're looking at here is an income expenditure budget. Uh, you'll notice that expenses are listed there, uh, both in monthly and annual terms. And then the expenses are characterized as a percent of, of gross income. I've highlighted uh, two areas of this budget, entertainment and, and vacation, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Uh, Jim mentioned that there can be a fair amount of resistance to uh, implementing a, a budget. And I think that has to do oftentimes with a misunderstanding about the uses of budgeting. Uh, oftentimes people think that, that uh, the inevitable result of budgeting is spending less money and enjoying life less. Um, I think it's, it's broader than that and more strategic. So I've highlighted vacation there. Uh, assuming that the purpose of spending money is to bring some kind of, of happiness or satisfaction to your life, a vacation is actually a reasonable way to do that. There's now some studies to support that. If uh, you're asking why someone would need to produce a study to validate that point, uh, you're in good company, uh, but there is research out there now to support it. One of the things that the research point out, points out is when you use money to buy things, say a new jacket or, or golf clubs, there is an immediate uh, burst of happiness that comes with it but it diminishes over time. Uh, vacations function a little bit differently in that there is an immediate uh, uh, experience of satisfaction or joy, but because it stays in your mind as a memory, it actually continues to contribute to your happiness years later. All of us, however, have gone through periods where the organization and the travel involved in, in a good vacation just isn't appetizing anymore, and this is where budgeting can be useful because every year you want to make sure that you're planning on things to rejuvenate yourself, to be at play, uh, to be separated from work. And if you were uh, in a year where vacation wasn't really uh, what you were looking for, then you can strategically allocate to a different place in your budget and have something else uh, move into the place of, of vacations to serve the purpose that vacations do. So in this case, this hypothetical client could plan in advance to allocate more money to entertainment, uh, take some staycations and take care of themselves, uh, go to movies, more theaters, plan more times to, to dine with friends, and still get the, the rejuvenation and the play that, that we all need uh, without uh, spending less, uh, just being strategic within the, the budget that exists. Another way to use budgets is to uh, assess them with debt and savings ratios in mind. So there's four ratios that we have listed on this chart, and the first is savings, which suggests that uh, people should save between, at a minimum, 5 to 10 percent of their gross income per year. The remaining ratios are debt ratios, starting with housing expenses. That housing expenses 
should be no more than 28% of gross, gross income. Then you look at total debts, which is a combination of housing expenses and all other debts, and that uh, this, this ratio suggests that you should not exceed 36% of gross, gross income to service total debt payments. Finally, we come to consumer debts, which is a little bit different. It's a function of net income. By net income, I mean net of taxes, and this uh, ratio suggests that uh, people should not spend more than 20% of their net income to service consumer debt. So with those ratios in mind, we can take a look at another hypothetical budget and assess it for its areas of strength and weakness. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll notice that the savings rate is two, about 2%, 2 and that falls below the standard that, that is suggested by the, the ratio that we just reviewed. We'd like to see that more in the 5 to 10% area. Consumer debt, on the other hand, is uh, in a healthy place. Um, this is a little bit uh, misguided because these are gross figures um, on, the, on the far right column there. But even if you treated this hypothetical client with a 50% effective tax rate, they're still well within bounds. All the way at the top, uh, the housing expense debt ratio there is a, a, an area of possible improvement and concern. Spending 40% of gross income on housing uh, is perhaps uh, excessive. Uh, oftentimes with our younger clients who are very focused on uh, building up enough money to make a down payment on a home, the other side of that equation is overlooked, which is if is the income in place to service the debt, and budgeting can be an effective way to take a look at that. Now I want to move on to a practice worth quitting, and that is taking a singular view of the market to make important decisions in your life that impact your, your financial circumstances. What you're looking at here is a results report that we often use in our, our financial planning. It charts the, the account balance of a hypothetical client over the period of retirement. So they start with about $1.3 million. Uh, they wait five years, retire, and, and then uh, move through their entire retirement um, successfully. As you can see, the, the line reaches the safety margin, which means that they uh, end their plan with, with money still in reserves. We would characterize this as an optimistic view of, of the future uh, because this, is, this fixes variables. You'll notice that the, the return that is given to this particular portfolio is 8.5% year over year. No variance is introduced in this plan, and uh, that has never occurred. Uh, this is using a historical average and is a relevant look, but is not the only look that one should take in assessing whether they're ready to say retire. 